the formal title is Biotechnology and Food Systems in Developing Countries, the Scientific Promise and Scientists' Responsibilities. But I really want to put this uh, address in the context of what I take to be the challenge facing all of us working in this broad area of uh, nutrition, alleviating hunger, dealing with poverty, uh, worrying about developing countries. Uh, most of you will at least be aware that the Millennium Development Goals, which have been agreed to uh, by all the multilateral uh, development agencies and by virtually all of the, the, the major donor countries individually, have set uh, a very ambitious challenge uh, before us to reduce hunger, malnutrition, and poverty by half by the year 2015 from levels sometime around 2000 or slightly before. I want to argue tonight that biotechnology through genetically modified foods can help reach this goal. Uh, but the train of logic is going to be long and filled with a lot of caveats and you'll see that biotech is not a magic bullet for ending hunger and malnutrition. Do remember the, my, my Wall Street incarnation. I'm fully aware that world markets are absolutely awash in food commodities. I'm aware that rich countries are spending one billion dollars per day in subsidies to keep their farmers in business in competition with farmers in poor countries who don't see those kinds of subsidies. My younger brother does still run the family farm, and as he says, he farms Washington in order to stay in business. In this kind of a world, how does biotechnology help? To answer what seems like a fairly simple question, we need to understand the problems that we're trying to solve. And for this, a bit of history is in order. Uh, but I want to review the successes and failures of the first Green Revolution, because if the promise of biotech is in Gordon Conway's uh, book title, A Doubly Green Revolution, then we need to understand the origins and impact of the first Green Revolution that started in the mid-1960s and which is still having a huge impact uh, on the welfare of billions of people, especially in developing countries. So first, a brief, uh, a very brief review of the multiple impact of the first Green Revolution. You will be aware it was accomplished through traditional breeding techniques, but with very radical objectives to redesign the basic architecture of rice and wheat plants. This first green revolution, short stature, was responsive to fertilizer, to good treatment, and it sharply raised the genetic potential of these crucial grain crops, rice and wheat, and especially in irrigated conditions. The Green Revolution lowered the real costs of staple food grains and made them much more affordable to the poor, directly increasing their food intake and improved nutritional status and work capacity is what made that's the first major impact of the Green Revolution. Let me call that strong link number one between higher productivity for staple food grains and improved food intake and nutritional status, work capacity for the poor. This higher productivity then secondly contributed to growth in rural economies and stimulated overall economic growth. This too is a very strong link that is just being rediscovered in the donor community after slipping out of fashion for a number of years. And finally, because food grains tend to be the wage good in poor societies, uh, workers often spend 40, 50, 60 percent of their income on the basic food grain. Lower food costs means that hiring more labor is productive and profitable, and this contributes to greater employment 
and therefore to reduced poverty. So that's the third direct link that we see by raising the productivity of rice and wheat. That is the first green revolution. In combination, these three linkages, if you like, led to pro-poor growth. That is growth that differentially reached and helped poor people in those societies that were able to capitalize on the potential of the first green revolution. And that was mostly, as we know, in East and Southeast Asia. There were, of course, a number of problems with this first green revolution. It was very input intensive, especially using pesticides and fertilizers. It worked best on good soils with a high degree of water control, both irrigation and drainage. And this input intensity raised a lot of questions about how sustainable the Green Revolution was. Secondly, it was mostly about rice and wheat. There were few gains for root crops, cassava, potatoes, yams, sweet potatoes, for traditional legumes such as lentils and cowpeas, uh, for fruits and vegetables, even few gains for other cereal grain staples suitable for the semi-arid tropics such as the millets and, and sorghum. Thus, most of Africa and a surprisingly large share of sub, sub, the Indian subcontinent uh, where the biggest problems exist, these areas uh, of the world were left out or nearly left out of the first green revolution. Third, the productivity gains that come from using traditional breeding techniques, the kind that were used for rice and wheat at Erie, the Rice Research Institute in Los Banos, or CIMIT, the maize and corn, uh, maize and wheat uh, research institute in Mexico, the productivity gains from using traditional breeding techniques have apparently been exhausted for at least these two uh, grains, for rice and for wheat. Best practice yields at these research centers and others uh, have been absolutely flat now for over a decade. There have been no improvements in yield potential. There seems to be some evidence that there might even be a slight decline in the biological potential of these two crops. Uh, soil quality may be responsible for that. Uh, I, I will put as a side agenda, we know an awful lot more about plants above the ground than we do about plants below the ground. Uh, as a consequence then, growth in cereal yields at the farm level in developing countries has slowed down quite dramatically. It was almost 3% per year between 1967 and 1982, and it's dropped to under 2% per year from 82 to 97. And the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, is projecting that yields will grow just slightly more than a percent per year over the next 20 years. So there's been a marked deceleration in yield growth in, for cereals. And consequently then, the strong link between agricultural growth and overall economic growth uh, has slowed down as well. The stimulation from agricultural growth to the rest of the economy has slowed. There's a recent paper by Gaia and Imai uh, who calculated the rate of growth in agriculture and in the overall economy that would be needed to meet the Millennium Development Goals that I outlined at the beginning. In order to cut the head count poverty index, to be technical about it, uh, to cut that index in half, economic growth will have to reach a little over 4% per year, and agricultural growth uh, between 4 and 4.5% four and per year uh, between now and 2020, if the Millennium Development Goals are to be achieved. But the growth rates from 1985 to the year 2000 were only 0.6% for the overall economy and 0.4% for agriculture. So you see the nature of the challenge ahead of us. We, we need a full order of magnitude increase in uh, both agriculture and economic growth. We must find a way to get agriculture moving if we're going to meet these Millennium Challenge goals. So then, what's the role of biotech in this? Five basic categories that I think we should think about, ranging from very general contributions 
uh, through agriculture to economic growth down to very specific contributions to reducing malnutrition, perhaps through uh, micronutrient availability. There's a really good review of these topics, by the way, in a book by Martin Crispiels and David Sadava called Plants, Genes, and Crop Biotechnology. I am summarizing what they know. Um, first, general yield advances, just advancing the frontier of yield potential, especially for the key food crops, is needed to stimulate agriculture-led growth and lower food prices. The basic mechanisms here work through employment generation and food security for the poor, but that's where most of the action will be as we try to achieve these millennium development goals. Secondly, we need productivity gains for agricultural systems in degraded and hostile environments, especially because that's where many of the world's poorest farmers live. Problems of salinity, aluminum toxicity, drought, and so on uh, may well be more amenable to rapid productivity advances with biotech technology uh, than through traditional breeding, although there clearly is scope for traditional breeding in this arena. Third, we need productivity gains for the non-grain crops and for livestock because these commodities have much better demand opportunities as people's incomes increase and a middle class emerges. These gains will help stimulate agricultural diversification, and this diversification will help permit farmers get out of what is increasingly a trap of growing staple grain commodities that have very low income potential. China, in its uh, commitments that it made when joining the World Trade Organization, the WTO, uh, placed a very heavy bet on this diversification process as a way of coping with the problems, very widespread problems, of rural poverty that China faces. They intend their farmers to get out of growing wheat and rice, except in the heavily favored areas for that, and to grow specialty crops. I warn uh, the farmers from Washington down uh, to California California growing almonds and peaches and apricots and apples. Uh, that's not the future. Uh, China's going to be the future in that. Fourth, there is a real potential for reduced input use, especially of pesticides, with uh, continued advances uh, in, in uh, genetic technology. Uh, Pesticide use in particular has had very serious health consequences for farm workers in countries with uh, limited safety regulations on the use of hazardous chemicals. The potential for biotechnology to contribute to sustainable agricultural systems through much more efficient utilization of water, of nutrients, and agricultural chemicals may actually be its most important long-run promise. And finally, biofortification of key foodstuffs with better availability of micronutrients, such as iron and vitamin A, could offer very real uh, welfare gains. Even this, technical as it sounds, is a very controversial area as the heated debate over golden rice demonstrates, as most of you will know, golden rice has uh, foreign genes inserted to improve the availability of uh, vitamin A precursor. The debate, however, has tended to be all or nothing. Um, one critique I saw is that even if children ate nothing but golden rice, it would only provide a quarter of their vitamin A requirements, and therefore it didn't solve the problem, and so we shouldn't use it. Uh, my colleague at Tufts University, Steve Block, has shown in joint research with Helen Keller International that even modest additions of vitamin A to the diets of poor children in central Java can have noticeable health consequences because so many of them have serum retinol levels that are just 
just below acceptable levels for normal growth and health. And so it doesn't take very much to get them above that, uh, that level. So modest improvements, especially if the modest improvements are sustained by the food system itself instead of from outside sources, uh, can have lasting welfare consequences. So what stands in the way of this beautiful potential that I've just outlined? Uh, I, I three, l let me summarize issues from three different arenas, from science, from economics, and from politics. Uh, the scientific issues are very complicated because there are so many avenues by which modern genetic technology can be used to improve the productivity of agricultural systems. And we should understand, many of these techniques do not involve splicing exotic genes into staple foods. There's lots of ways to use genetic technology to improve productivity without actually putting uh, exotic genes. Yeah. To, to this observer, it seems like almost anything is possible now. And so the key question is, what do we want? Science is able to deliver on that question. Second, the economic issues. This is my own expertise, and I want us to understand that from an economic perspective, what will stand in the way of the potential for biotechnology is whether or not it will be profitable. That will be the bottom line for the economic issues. The answers are going to depend on several things, but first and foremost, it's going to depend on consumer acceptance of genetically modified products. If consumers, for whatever reason, misinformation, beliefs, whatever, if consumers reject genetically modified foods in substantial ways, it will not be profitable to, to use the technology. Um, this is not going to be limited just to foods, because agriculture obviously has the potential to produce a lot of non-food products. I just saw uh, in an issue of science a suggestion that plants really are going to become the nanotechnology factories of the future. Um, and so we, we may well be able to get plants to do virtually anything that we want. Secondly, the, uh, the profitability of biotechnology will depend on the regulatory costs of developing and utilizing the technology itself. It's possible that, uh, we obviously see a trade-off here, uh, we can make the regulatory process so demanding that consumers are completely satisfied, but so expensive that we can't use the technology. We need some kind of a balance if this is going to work. Third, it's going to depend on supply and demand conditions in world commodity markets, at least for the, the bulk commodities like the grains and soybeans. Um, and of course, those market conditions are going to depend on the contribution of biotechnology itself. It's going to be a simultaneous uh, situation, but we should, not, uh, we should not think that what we're doing is solving a problem of great scarcity uh, when, in fact, the world's commodity markets are uh, full of, of, of uh, grain and, and soybeans. Finally, there may be a, a potential to develop niche markets for commodities that some farmers will be able to exploit. My favorite example is not really uh, a GM, but it's certainly a biotech uh, story. It's growing asparagus in Peru during the winter in North America from tissue culture that was started, that started each year in Boston and flown down and then it, they're, they're planted out. That's high-tech stuff. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see this stuff in the supermarket in January. That's the global food system at work. That's really globalization. And then the political issues. Without question, these are the most difficult. And the mechanisms for resolving them are, are highly imperfect. We don't have good ways of resolving political questions about genetic, uh, genetically modified food. 
From the perspective of developing countries, there are five areas of concern and policy action. Um, for those of you interested in this dimension, uh, I refer you to a very nice paper by Rob Parlberg, uh, Governing the GM Crop Revolution Policy Choices for Developing Countries, an IFPRI discussion paper, uh, paper number 33. It's available to download from the IFPRI website. Uh, and I take these five topics topics from Rob's uh, recent work. The first is how do countries deal with intellectual property rights? What the United States would like uh, as an official position is full recognition of the uh, patent rights of uh, companies or scientists who develop a particular uh, genetic modification and, uh, and, and get a patent issued. The key issue here from developing countries' point of view is the farmer's rights to use patented seeds in a second crop and third cropping year and afterwards rather than continuing to buy the, 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 the seed technology uh, each year. This is obviously not a problem for hybrids and companies have been in the hybrid seed business for a long time. But these are, these are seeds that breed true but have patent, patented te uh, genetic technology in them. So there's a real issue here, part of it emotional, uh, much of it economic, um, but in the end it's going to be political. Uh, secondly is a biosafety concern. Uh, the, the, how do countries deal with the perceived risks to ecosystems of introducing crops with uh, exotic genetic material in them? Um, this, is, this is not a zero risk issue. Uh, if it were completely zero, we'd be able to, to shout down the protesters. But it's obviously not quite zero, uh, and we don't know. Uh, there's, there's a need for further work here. Uh, it's clear that whatever dangers there are have been hyped out of all proportion to what we understand the scientific issues to be, but we need further work to figure this out. Third is their attitude towards trade in genetically modified products, um, and indeed what many developing countries are discovering is that rich countries are in effect putting a boycott on their agricultural trade if there's any genetically modified material growing in their country anywhere. Uh, this puts a, a, a real damper, if you like, on the use of uh, genetically modified material, even in poor countries. The fourth topic is food safety and consumer choice. Um, how do countries deal with a perception that there's something unnatural or unhealthy about these foods? What kind of labeling requirements do they have? What kind of, of information do they get out to, uh, to their consumers? And finally is a question of what kind of public research investments they're making. Um, really in, uh, important question, what domestic research capacity on biotechnology do poor countries have to have, not to, so much to develop the technology themselves, but to use it safely and wisely, to have the regulatory regimes in place, uh, to deal effectively with the, the question. Uh, and here it looks like every country will have to develop uh, at least a substantial capacity of its own. Uh, Rob Harburg had four case studies as part of this paper. He looked at what was going on in Brazil, China, India, and Kenya, all countries with at least some scientific capacity to do significant uh, research on and utilization of genetically modified foods. He discovered that only China seemed to be pursuing an independent approach to GM technology with respect to the needs of the country itself. The other three countries were very heavily influenced in their approaches by external pressure, especially from European countries and from a very vocal set of, of NGOs. And I, I know uh, many uh, folks think that the precautionary principle is, is the appropriate way forward. It's certainly invoked in these political arguments. But I think we have to understand that the precautionary principle, at least as narrowly uh, defined, is more a mechanism for defending a very different kind of agricultural policy in Europe than it is a scientifically valid way of evaluating technology for costs and benefits. Uh, if there are costs, 
then we need a technology, we need some kind of mechanism for evaluating how those costs relate to benefits. It is rare that a new technology gives us benefits with no costs at all. So where do we go? Um, the only way out of this political stalemate seems to me to be to create partnerships that cut across interests in a mutually productive way. And let me just put three out that you might think about. First are partnerships between universities and the private sector, especially in basic genetic research. A good example is right here in, in, in San Diego. Uh, I, I love the name. The Center for Molecular Agriculture that, uh, that Martin Chris Fields runs at, at UCSD uh, has a very close collaboration between the university and, and the private sector. Secondly, we could have partnerships between agricultural companies and development foundations. Uh, the recently announced African Agricultural Technology Foundation was just set up in Nairobi, Kenya by the Rockefeller Foundation with financial support from USAID and DFID, the, uh, the British aid uh, agency. Four big companies joined in and made this sound like it's going to be important. Monsanto, DuPont, Dow AgriSciences, and Syngenta. Those four companies hold a very large share of the important patents and intellectual knowledge about agricultural biotechnology. They've agreed, these four companies have agreed to share their biotechnology free with, Af with African scientists. They're going to donate the patent rights, the seed varieties, the laboratory know-how, and other assistance. What do they, and importantly, their shareholders, get out of that? They get a lot of goodwill, and that might actually help resolve some other issues on the policy table. And there is the hope that if we can get agriculture moving in Africa, Africa itself can develop and become a much more dynamic marketplace for not just for these companies, but for economies around the globe. Um, Africa is not that at the moment. And third, and particularly for the folks here uh, in, in this room, a partnership between the nutrition community and the biotech opinion makers, the NGOs and the policy analysts out there. Somehow we need to get you folks, the nutrition community, engaged in these debates. You have the scientific expertise and importantly, you have the public credibility to be very effective voices here uh, as voices of reason. And I urge you to use it. Thank you very much.